Our special guest on NDTV today is the man who's been closely tracking what the current status is, not just in India, but across the world of coronavirus cases, cases, mortality rates, positivity rates. Joining me now is Dr. David Nabarro. Now, he's the special uh, envoy in charge, appointed by the WHO director of tracking COVID cases around the world. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nabarro, for joining us. Sir, the first question, where do you think India stands today? It's a time when our cases are going up every day. Uh, the worry, of course, is that we are nowhere near flattening the curve yet or at our peak. Where do you think India stands today? Thank you very much indeed, Sonia. As I look at the numbers, I reach the following conclusions. First of all, the lockdown has managed to keep the virus reasonably well located in a number of specific places in Maharashtra, Gujarat, Delhi, Rajasthan and Tamil Nadu, uh, but it's very much located in some of the uh, urban areas. It's very challenging to control this disease in very densely populated urban situations. And I really right. admire the tenacity with which government authorities have built up their ability to identify people with the disease. Mm -hmm. The numbers of cases are I guess they're high if you look at the absolute number, but compared to the population of India, that is, a, a form, fortunately, not a, a, a very, very large number. Mm -hmm. And the percentage of positives on the testing has stayed pretty constant between 3 and 4%. So I can understand now that authorities will be saying, we've got ourselves properly prepared right across the country. Mm -hmm. Let's get people moving again. Now, we do know that when movement restarts, then there will be some increase in cases. People should not be disturbed about that. That's to be expected. But now the government has the capacity to really uh, suppress outbreaks wherever they break, build up because it's got everybody in position and ready. I do agree that in the coming uh, month or two, there will be some increase in cases over time. But like other experts uh, who have been commenting with experience of the situation in India, I expect things to stabilise in coming months mm -hmm. as we learn much more about how to contain the virus. And as people everywhere across the country uh, become aware of the actions they need to take, particularly being able to isolate themselves when they have symptoms of the disease. Mm -hmm. And most of all, perhaps, I just want one more point, and that is that I do realize that in going through this process over the last 40 days, this has been an enormous, enormous sacrifice by hundreds of millions of people because they've just not been able to get their, their, their daily wages and uh, they've had to really do an awful lot of moving in order to try to uh, comply with uh, some of the strictures that have been put in place. And I, I suppose that all I can say from where I'm sitting is thank you for everything you've all done in India to get ahead of this virus and to really work out how to get on top of the pandemic. So, uh, Dr. Nabarro, so the point you're making, and I think that's an important point, that given India's uh, population, over 120 crores, that uh, an estimated, say, around 53,000 cases isn't alarming. You're saying that the positivity rate, the number of cases testing positive, is still about 3 to 4 percent. But the question now uh, to you, Dr. Nabarro, should India be doing more testing? Because, of course, uh, we know Maharashtra says their cases are so high because uh, that's where the most testing is being done. Do you think that we need to expand that testing across India? And the focus on urban centers, the big worry, of course, that these are also the economic drivers of India. Well, I must stress that because India acted quickly, mm -hmm. when a relatively small number of cases have been detected in the country, I believe that you have got the situation under control in most settings. Of mm -hmm. course, it is difficult to control COVID in densely populated urban areas. And I appreciate that it's been a tough in some of the cities where the virus is moving. But in general, I would say for the whole country, yes, you are. You're, you're certainly slowing the rate at which the outbreak numbers double. Your, your doubling time now is about 11 days, which is a really good impact. However, 
uh, I have to keep saying that this virus isn't going away. And unfortunately, it's a really dangerous virus. It can creep up on us sometimes and catch us unawares. So what we have to keep looking out for over time is, first of all, clusters of people with uh, acute respiratory illness. Secondly, increased numbers of people turning up at health centres seeking care. And then thirdly, of course, uh, people seriously ill and perhaps dying in particular locations. I don't think it'll get to that because you've got everybody across the country on high alert and you'll stay on high alert for some months to come. And you've also built up testing across the country, mm -hmm. which means that you can actually keep an eye on where the virus is. Uh, so it's those sorts of indicators, test positivities, uh, numbers of people with illness, people coming to health centres, people being seriously ill and needing treatment. Mm -hmm. Those are the indicators that will be looked at by the authorities across the country on a very regular basis. It'd be like having a big dashboard mm -hmm. and keeping a check on the numbers, as well as, of course, getting information from the uh, district, uh, district commissioners and other officials right across your uh, 750 districts. So that, that's really the focus on the testing, and I think India is uh, scaling up its testing as much as possible every day. But also uh, the point being made, I mean, already comparisons are being made about whether Mumbai can become like New York, and the worries about our big cities, Mumbai, Delhi, Ahmedabad, uh, Surat, etc. Uh, while you've been tracking it, what's your assessment of where our cities are at the moment? To, yeah, thank you for the two points. One of the indicators you look at when you're trying to work out uh, testing and, and its efficacy is what's the percentage positive rate and how is that shifting over time? If your percentage of positive stays pretty constant and India's has, that suggests that you probably are testing in, in a very good way mm -hmm. in order to try to get a sense of where the virus is. Yes, it will be more in urban areas. That's what tends to happen in most countries. Uh, and you want to actually try to keep it in the urban areas and suppress it there and not have it travel, the virus I mean, into rural communities. So I'm not surprised that it is in the cities you've mentioned. And I'm not surprised that the numbers are still quite high because firstly, the conditions in cities do make transmission of the virus much easier. And secondly, of course, yes, you've got the, the capacity to test and and that is showing you, uh, as you said, that there is quite high numbers, particularly in the cities uh, in the west of the country. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, good that the virus seems to be staying pretty static in the in particular places. I think where it would get disturbing is if suddenly new clusters appear and then outbreak numbers build up mm -hmm. in other places. And if they do appear, what you have to do then is to respond really fast with a very focal action in order to try to prevent the virus from spreading more widely. Right. And I, I am sensing that the capacity of the government's health 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 um, uh, officials and also the rest of the, uh, of the government is very well focused on this because when you do have an outbreak somewhere and you've got to suppress it quickly mm -hmm. and you ask people to stop moving, you've also got to have in place all the relief services that can make sure Absolutely. that people get food mm -hmm. and cash and all the other necessities so that you don't end up with, uh, at, at, at the same time as you're controlling the virus, uh, uh, humanitarian challenges as well. Right, and of course, we've seen major humanitarian challenges uh, with this lockdown at the moment uh, today as well. But just to ask uh, Dr. Nabarro, while we're looking at the various uh, models across the world, the India model, where, of course, we've had the world's biggest lockdown involving over 120 crore people. You've had the US model, the UK model, the Vietnam model, South Korea, so many different models which, with differing levels of success. Which do you think have been has been the most effective model amongst these, and I'm not asking you just because I'm Indian to choose the India model, but which do you think has been the most effective model that countries have used? Sonia, thank you very much indeed. I suppose that the position that we've always taken since this uh, unfortunate pandemic started was that because it's a coronavirus, uh, a very easily transmissible coronavirus, 
that can have some really unpleasant consequences. You must act quickly as soon as you have any signs of the disease. And it does require being able to respond by isolating people with the disease and finding their contacts and isolating them as well. And then, if necessary, in, in implementing movement restrictions. And uh, yes, uh, uh, some East Asian countries did this, and when they, and that's because they had SARS before in 2003, mm -hmm. and they really knew what to do. And then I watched what happens in other parts of the world where countries were slower to act, and they've ended up with some very, very big outbreaks. And then India and parts of Africa and several countries of Latin America, they saw what was happening around the world, and they said, we're not going to delay. Mm -hmm. We're going to be really strong from the start even though it causes us pain, because we know that in the longer term, that's the best way to do it. And India has been a leader in this. I'm not saying this because you're interviewing me. It's because of what I've seen. But I do want to stress that there have been several other countries that mm -hmm. one might call middle income or developing countries that have done the similar kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Be robust and act quickly. It requires enormous political courage to do that, you know. And I think that what we're seeing from WHO more and more is that middle income and, and sometimes poorer countries as well are, do, are showing this incredible political courage mm -hmm. so that they act quickly and robustly right at the beginning and don't sort of take any half-hearted measures, but they're strong. Mm -hmm. So I do, I, do, I do value that and praise that. And I think that as long as, as people can continue to work with each other and then with their authorities, to maintain this measure of alertness and rapid response, you'll be able to get the economy back on track quite quickly. Right. And then you'll be able to live with this virus as a threat, but you won't let it disturb the way in which society works or the economy works. Right, L living with the virus, the new normal in a sense. But let me ask you, uh, Dr. Nabarro, that at a time when the WHO is working and tracking this pandemic, you face criticism, as in the WHO has faced huge criticism from, well, the President of the United States and some other countries for what is being described as a pro-China stand, that the WHO is acting as an agent of China. How do you respond uh, to this allegation at the time of a global pandemic? Thanks. Well, thanks for that question. I, I, I'm not going to be very long in my answer, but there are some things I need to say. Mm -hmm. The first thing is that really the people who are leading the world's fight against the coronavirus are, are what I call public health people. They're people, mostly doctors, but not always, who spend their time studying the health of populations. They just work to try to make sure that everybody ensures health that is as good as possible. And... Um, they are remaining united. They're working together across countries like never before, like the, the medical researchers who are trying to find treatments and vaccines. And then inside the WHO itself, really a quite small organization with a budget one third of the United States Centers for Disease Control. People have been working flat out since January. They're still working flat out. They're, they're kind of professionals like you or me. We don't try to have uh, to seek favor with any specific country. We work with every country on a totally equal footing because that's what we believe in and that's what we've done for decades. But of course, the people who govern the WHO are the governments of, of individual countries mm -hmm. and they don't always agree. And we've known that for years that there are battles between countries. And, and when they battle and they find reasons to get uh, frustrated with each other. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't stop us, the public health people, doing our job to the best of our ability. And we're going to go on doing that, whether there's a president who doesn't like what we do or a prime minister who thinks we just do things differently. I mean, that's their business. They're the politicians. But we're the professionals and we do the work trying to keep everybody as healthy and safe as possible. I know there are many, many, many people who are so densely frustrated by this pandemic. So are we. We don't want this, nor does anybody. We just want to work to try to push it back, get that virus back in its box as quickly as possible so that normal health services can resume, so that life can go on. That's our mission, and we won't give up even when a, a president or a prime minister criticizes us. We'll go on doing the best we can because that's what we're here for. Uh, so that's your answer to the China allegation. Uh, but Dr. Nabarro, back to India and really 
where do you think India really is now? Uh, we've had the AIMS director saying, uh, the All India In Institute of Medical Science director saying that our peak will be in June or July. Do you think that things are going to get worse before they get better? When do you think India's flattening of the curve will actually happen? I think there will be sporadic outbreaks mm -hmm. over time, and I suspect that there will be quite a build-up of outbreaks immediately after the lockdown is released, in, and so we're talking about May and into June. But then I think that because all the systems will be well prepared, then from then on, the outbreaks will be contained, the number of cases will come down, mm -hmm. and the country will be able, to, as I said, to get on with working. So I agree with that kind of timing, that around uh, towards the end of this month, and into June and July, it'll be a, a quite flat peak, but I think that peak will come and then things will get better. It all really does depend on whether we, the people, are able to adapt our lives so that we can prevent this virus being, from being transmitted from person to person. Right, so June, July, a possible peak, a flat peak, and then you say things will get better depending on we, the people. But uh, one aspect which has been interesting, uh, Dr. Nabarro, is even that as cases have risen, that our mortality rate is still much, much better than many other countries in the world. Why do you think that is? And uh, do you see that as a kind of common factor in Asia, that the mortality rates have been uh, much lower than they are in, say, Europe or the U.S.? Well, we're looking really carefully at all these numbers. And you're quite right, actually, that it does seem like mortality associated with coronavirus is particularly high in countries with a, a relatively large number of people in the older age groups. Um, whereas in many uh, middle income countries, but particularly let's look at India, we see that perhaps the mortality rate is not so high. And that's firstly, I think, due to a different age structure of the population. Secondly, we do wonder whether in hot climates, particularly dry heat, the virus just doesn't trans transmit so easily. And there are other factors that I'm sure will come out. But yes, I do agree with you that on the basis of your statistics, it does look as though the death rates associated with coronavirus infection are lower than they are in several other countries. It's a good sign. Right. So that's a, that's a good sign. Of course, we'll be looking at much more of the data. I'm sure you will, but sir. Uh, finally, the WHO had a crucial meeting this week on uh, funding for a vaccine. Uh, top countries pledged uh, money to this, except, of course, the United States. Where are we in actually getting closer to a vaccine against the coronavirus? Well, I think most of your viewers know that when you're trying to protect a population against an invading virus, one of the things you can do is to develop a vaccine based on a modified form of the virus that then builds up the human defense systems against it. And everybody is working super hard to try to find a possible vaccine, but then it has to be tested. And it's a rigorous testing process to check that it is both safe and at the same time effective, i.e. that it has no side effects and that it really works. And, and for some viruses, it's taken quite a long time to develop vaccines, and, and in some it's not been successful at all so far. Mm -hmm. So I don't like to say there will be a vaccine. I like to say we've got to work really hard to develop a vaccine, mm -hmm. then we've got to put it through all the tests, and then if we add it all up, I think the earliest time is 18 months but it may take a bit longer. And that's why we've got to get prepared with our virus defences in our communities, mm -hmm. with the testing capacities and our ability to shut down outbreaks. We've got to have that in place because there will be a bit of a wait before the vaccine is available. Uh, and then we've got to set up all the processes to make sure that everybody everywhere can access the vaccine if they want to. Absolutely, Dr. Nabarro. So I think that's the big message, the good sign for India is mortality rate is still low. Vaccine isn't yet around the corner, so we have to protect ourselves. Thank you, Dr. Nabarro, very much for joining me from Geneva. It was Sonia, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure talking to you and through you connecting with viewers of uh, NDTV. Thank you very much indeed for the chance. And I look forward, if ever I can be of any use, to connecting again. Thank you, Dr. Nabarro. Thank you.